I've recently become obsessed with two things. Rain World, a game about cute little cat-like creatures who brave an unforgiving simulated ecosystem. And the fear of God. God. Welp, I am a video essayist. It was bound to happen at some point. Sweets has lost his fucking mind. Now, to be fair, saying Rain World is a game about cute little cat-like creatures is like saying Death Note is about a boy in his diary. Technically true, missing a lot. Because Rain World is a story about everything. Family, technology, religion, time, morality, birth, life, death, politics, revenge, forgiveness, and most importantly, God. So I want to examine the cute little scug game through the lens of the worship and fear of creator transcendence and death. We are getting esoteric in this bitch. And so, a video that started out as me wanting to make a sequel to the most successful thing I've ever made and showcase cute little scug stories, has instead consumed my life with the pursuit of defining God in a physical and artistic sense. And that's only taken all of humanity, all of our existence, so I'm pretty sure I could do it in about 17 minutes. This video is probably gonna be a little bit less funny than some of my other ones, kinda like this one, except this one is unfunny because making it made me depressed. And this one's gonna be unfunny because I just had to think really hard. So without further ado, let's talk about Rain World, again. Chapter one, defining God. That's a crazy chapter one. Rain World is an incredibly religious game with its world building themes and even mechanics based in the concept of karma and cyclical rebirth, which is best compared to Buddhism. Okay. This penetrates every level of the game and is pretty much impossible to escape from. This is not religious theory or doctrine. This is the undeniable, tangible reality of how Rain World works. There is a constant cycle of life and death, and it is based on your fucking CCP social credit score. And because the highly spiritual elements of the game are so present, you'd be forgiven for not noticing the fact that there is no God. I, I, I always say God with like a hard G. I don't know why. God. Did you get God? You gotta hit it. There is no creation myth. There is no reference to some highest metaphysical being that is the center of this religion. But God or gods are mentioned several times throughout the game as a more solid and physical concept. So before I get all weird about stuff, the first question I want to answer is in the context of Rain World, what is God? More specifically, how will I be using God in this context? Because Rain World is not a game of one God. In this sense, I'll be referring to gods as creators. God! <laughs> I love that stupid joke. Those that make others, because to that which they make, they are God. If something designs you, makes you, controls your environment, regulates your existence, and pushes you towards transcendent experience, then what word is there for that other than... God. Because Rain World is a story about creators and that which they create. So with that out of the way, we can jump into chapter two bottom of the food chain. The game allows you to play as one of eight different slug cats, but no matter which one you pick, you're still functionally on the bottom of the food chain, only being slightly higher than like bats. If you only interact with the world on this level, you'll do what most new players do, and that is run around in circles, get incredibly lost, promptly say fuck this game and put it away for two months, and you'll never really interact with the more spiritual elements of the game. The game will appear skin deep. You are the family hamster that gets killed by lizards, and birds, and sea monsters, and people, and platforming. And by putting you in this intelligent yet feeble position, you are put in the best circumstance to experience God. If your avatar was less intelligent, then you wouldn't be able to comprehend God. But if it was more capable, then it wouldn't need it. Every one of the slug cats serves a different purpose or has a different mission, each serving to examine or expand upon different elements of the game and its world through their different abilities. For a better overview of the game's main, oh my fucking God, I have no patience. I have no time. I have nothing. I am a husk. For a better overview of the game's main mechanics and an explanation of the world, I already made a video about that stuff and the main campaign. Again, this video is going to be focused a bit more on the symbolic and metaphysical aspects of the game. But for now, I think it's probably best to go in chronological order, starting with the Spearmaster. The Spearmaster is without a doubt the most naturally violent of the slug cats. Being the only slug cat that is the source of its own weaponry, the Spearmaster has an infinite supply of, can you guess, that grows out of its tail. And unlike the other slug cats who need to eat regular food in order to fill their hunger meter and hibernate, the Spearmaster is fed by plunging its spears into living creatures. This means that an inherently more violent playstyle isn't encouraged, it's necessary. The only way that you can interact with the world is through violence, and that is by design as the Spearmaster was designed. The Spearmaster is something that the game refers to as a purposed organism, something that is designed to fulfill a specific task. In this case, the Spearmaster is a messenger 
messenger from one god to another. The message is stored in a bead which is embedded in the Spearmaster's body. In terms of personal liberties, the Spearmaster is the least free of any of the slug cats that you play as. No personal motivation or investment. They're here to put the fries in the bag. Not devout so much as predetermined. There's not a world in which the Spearmaster doesn't do this because it's what it was designed to do. And so you're going to make a journey that you are going to end up becoming very familiar with. You're going to meet your makers. Well, not not actually your makers. That's a different dude, but like the same same basic type of thing. These are five pebbles and looks to the moon. They are iterators and they are your gods. They're basically robots with the power to, among other things, design and purpose organisms. Different from the lizards, vultures, and scavengers that you're used to, these things are impossibly complex. They are fully removed from and above the ecosystem. You are a slave to what they want done. You are fully at their mercy. They are gods to you and one of them wants to die. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk about that more when I talk about the iterators. So for now, let's move on to the Artificer. In contrast to the Spearmaster, the Artificer is probably the most independent of any of the slug cats that you get to play as, with her entire campaign barely involving what the game refers to as the affairs of passing gods. And that's such a fucking cool line, goddammit, and it would be the title of this video if it wasn't already the title of a different video that goes over the game's lore that I highly recommend you go watch, I know I have, multiple times. The Artificer is a master of explosives, able to make explosive spears and give herself a double jump by just blowing herself up in various directions. Where many of this game's more quote-unquote intelligent creatures seek to escape this world's karmic cycle of life and death, the Artificer has fully succumbed to it. Um, I'm- I, I literally just have IDF joke in brackets. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that. Bracket? IDF joke question mark. I don't know what that means. The first five karma levels of this game are each tied to five parts of life that are believed to tie you to this world. The highest level is survival. And going down the list from there, you have gluttony, companionship, lust, and violence. While every other slug cat can move up this list by hibernating or down by dying, the Artificer is locked to violence. The Artificer does not care about the systems of the world and its workings. The Artificer does not care about God. The Artificer is a proud atheist of Reddit Nation. She used to be a mother. The phrase used to be a mother is never followed up by something good. Both of her children were killed by a group called scavengers, and so she has dedicated her life to wiping them out. Because she's locked to the lowest karma level, in order to use karma gates, the machines that block you from entering new regions unless you have a high enough social credit score, she has to use the bodies of dead scavengers who have a higher karma level than she does in order to progress. The Artificer's story is not about exploration or ascendance or brotherhood or god or any nuanced mix of any of the things that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. The Artificer's story is 100% about revenge. If the Spearmaster is what it meant to be predetermined by God, then the Artificer is what it means to be godless, to not care about the will of your creator. The Spearmaster was forced to interact with the world through violence, the Artificer does so by choice. The only interaction that the Artificer has with any of the iterators is pretty much just to get five pebbles to open the gates to his city so that she can kill more scavengers. The Artificer basically works as a foil character to the Spearmaster, both offering violent and destructive ways of going about the world, but with very different motivations. And this leads us to the last of the more violent slug cats that you can play as, the Hunter. The Hunter is one of the slug cats that's available in the main game. He's made to act as the sort of hard mode. He's more similar to the Spearmaster in that he's also purposed and obedient. He's also a messenger, tasked with transporting an item between gods, in this case a mechanical neuron to looks to the moon. Don't ask what that means, this is not supposed to be a lore summary. This time with the added twist that the Hunter is dying of what the community has deemed super cancer. The Hunter does what he's told, gets horrifically killed over and over again, and then canonically dies. I don't really know how or why some of the death stuff in this game is kind of inconsistent I think. But hey, my Mine was not her reason why, except it literally is, but I'm too lazy. The Hunter is, debatably, the last instance that we see of a slug cat being used as a purposed messenger. The Hunter is even more faded than the Spearmaster because he comes with a built-in death clock. Though it's not exactly clear why, this creature can live about as long as required to fulfill this task. When talking to both Five Pebbles and Looks to the Moon, they both commend the Hunter for how admirable it is that he's choosing to use his limited time in order to help Moon, but 
is it really his choice? He was purposed for this, made exactly for this. How much choice does he actually have? It'd be like commending an animal for fucking. It's what they were made to do. In the face of certain death, the hunter is pushed forward by the will and desire of his creator. He's pushed forward by the fear of God. It's what he was built for and instructed to do. It's all he really knows. So how much of it is free will and how much is tragic destiny. And this leads us to the more happy-go-lucky humanist, or I guess in this case slug catist era, creatures that don't have a strong sense of reverence or loyalty and are just kind of living, starting with the gourmand. The gourmand is just a big ass boy, he just wants to eat exotic foods and fuck around. Man after my own heart, really. He's a rotund little beast that tires out easily, but when he's got energy he is incredibly proficient. For one thing, Minecraft Steve over here has his own crafting system and shit, I'm not even gonna try to explain that. He does the most spear damage in the entire game and is heavy enough that he can kill things by just falling from high enough up. Apart from the obvious power differential between the gourmand and the iterators, he really has very little spiritual reverence or relevance. The main thing that the gourmand does is convince five pebbles to open the gates to the outer expanse, you know, wild crats living free and in the wild. That's why I called this the humanist era. It takes the emphasis off of the iterators and the fear of God and instead puts more emphasis on the proficiencies and communities of the slug cats alone. This is also the era in which the main game takes place, leading us to the survivor and the monk. Also, for some reason, this section of the video corrupted, so I'm now re-recording this like two weeks later. It's kind of impossible to talk about these two separately as they functionally have the same journey through the game with the survivor just doing it slightly before. Both of these slug cats ended up here by accident, with the survivor being washed away in the rain and the monk, his sibling, leaping in after him. The survivor is level zero, just a total blank slate, no special connections or abilities or anything like that. He's the base character of the game and so he's made to experience the world at the same time as you are. The monk is slightly different. The monk is more in tune with nature, which is why he acts as the game's easy mode. Because of things like creatures being less aggressive and karma gates being permanently opened once you first pass through them. These two also have much more personal and sympathetic motivations than the previous ones, with the survivor just trying to get home and the monk trying to find the survivor. However, both of their stories take an interesting turn when they bumblefuck their way over to meeting five pebbles. Because these two stupid fucking scugs are just looking for their family family and then this dipshit is like hey you should kill yourself now and then has them jump into this thing called the void sea which I'll talk about later and now we get to talk about a fun little thing called time travel because the gate to the outer expanse is only open for these guys if you've already played the gourmand storyline but because of how the slug cats are unlocked you have to beat the game first as either the monk or the survivor in order to unlock the gourmand so basically if you only beat this game once your ending is to love yourself and that is the canon ending which like dude what the fuck are you doing this is like if one of those mark rober squirrel obstacle course videos ended with fat gus jumping into a wood chipper i've always thought the ending of this game was a bit of a left curve in terms of slug cat motivations like yeah i just want to find my family and have cute little scug hugs but i guess you know melting into a puddle of goo is a good alternative and i honestly think that the best explanation for that is the fear of God. After talking to five pebbles, the goal of the game completely changes because your god, or one of your gods, told you to. This is a being with almost infinite knowledge, taller than the mountains, older than anything standing, who watched the last civilization die out. The only reason that this ending makes sense to me, other than these two just being fundamentally suicidal, is that they do it out of reverence or fear. They trust that this thing just knows better. And with that, time continues to pass, leading us to the Rivulet. There's not much that I can confidently say about the Rivulet. We don't know where it came from or why it exists, or even if there is a why for its existence. It's a slug cat who moves faster, jumps higher, and swims better than any slug cat before it. It even has gills to breathe underwater, which is necessary because it has been a long time and the world has changed. The rain comes more frequently and water is more abundant. Whether this slug cat was designed to live in this world or evolved through it can't 100% be said. However, there is one much stranger thing Say that again? than any of that. Despite not knowing where it came from, 
this slug cat already has a mark of communication. The mark of communication is this little dot over their heads. It's given to slug cats by iterators in order for the iterators to communicate to them. To them, it is one way. So he might be designed, but he might have just stumbled across another iterator before. We really have no way of knowing. Personally, I think it's the latter because the arc of this game is this sort of loose departure from iterator control. Minus the artificer, you start with slug cats that are very subservient and reverent towards the iterators. And even the artificer, though self-motivated, does do a service for one. Slowly over time, as these gods degrade and the world progresses, the slug cats become more and more independent. This is the tipping point at which the game goes from gods helping tiny little slug cats to slug cats saving and destroying gods. And this is exactly what the rivulet does, restoring power to the collapsed looks to the moon. And this is also exactly what the next and final slug cat does. This but before we talk about that, I think we need to talk a bit about the iterators. Chapter 3. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty in despair. Now, up to this point, I've been intentionally vague about what the iterators are and what they do. And I've been kind of misleading in how I present them. Because this is not an iterator. This is an iterator. When I said taller than the mountains, I didn't mean metaphorically or rhetorically or poetically or theoretically or in any other fancy way. These things are monolithic. And when I said they're basically robots with the power to, among other things, design and purpose organisms. That was a vast oversimplification because really they're closer to giant computers all with one purpose, to find a way to ascend, AKA permanently kill every living thing on the planet. And yes, I did say purpose. These things are purposed organisms because while they may be your God, they are not their own. The iterators were built by a species known as the Ancients, who I'll get a bit more into later. The Ancients at some point all decided that they were tired of living and wanted to die forever, but they couldn't figure out how to do it by themselves, so they decided to build computers that touch the skies to figure it out for them. Literally touch the skies. These things need so much water as coolant that they are the reason that the game is called Rain World. While they may be machines, they are, for all intents and purposes, People. They have their own personalities and ideas and friends and desires. They are far from emotionless. And while the iterators may seem like all-powerful gods, they have very strict limitations built into them by their creators. One of which, ironically, is a self-destruction taboo, meaning that the giant machines made to help people love themselves cannot love themselves. But eventually, all of the ancients leave, leaving the iterators solving a problem for no one. If the slug cats each showcase existence with different levels of involvement from your god, then the iterators show what it means to be abandoned by God, to be made for a specific purpose from which you cannot excuse yourself, you cannot stop yourself from performing, and then being left. Naturally, this made some of them a little mad. Among these was our boy Five Pebbles. Of the two iterators that we get to talk to, Five Pebbles is the one most likely to refer to himself as a god. He is very cognizant of his own power and the cruel irony of their situation. And so he went to work. At some point, another iterator, Sliver of Straw, sent out a message that would free all of the iterators from their task, a triple affirmative, a solution to ascendance that is found portable, and mass applicable. Problem is, Sliver of Straw immediately bit the dust after sending out this message. And so she became this kind of weird martyr figure with different groups having different ideas of what the triple affirmative meant. Some thought it was a glitch, some thought the solution killed her, and some thought dying was the solution. Five Pebbles fell into the last camp. He was dead set on destroying himself to find a solution, even to the detriment of others. Looks to the Moon is a much gentler and less intrusive iterator. She has the handle Big Sis Moon, if that gives you any indication as to her personality. Compared to Five Pebbles' raging god complex, she's softer. These two specifically were built incredibly close to each other and thus share a water source. When Five Pebbles started trying to fucking commit, it used a lot of energy and left Looks to the Moon with not enough water to properly function. This ended with Five Pebbles having an unfortunate development in the form of a living disease that is eating away at the body of his structure and the total collapse of Looks to the Moon. Through this selfish action, it's pretty easy to draw a parallel between Five Pebbles and the ancients who built him, both in terms of actions and motivations. But in order to understand that, I think I need to expand on something that I said earlier. Chapter 4, 
Redefining God. As I said at the beginning, for as much as I've been saying the word, there is no explicit God in Rain World. The game is very religious, but the religion centers more around the aspects of life and death than the divine. Thus, there is no direct being for the ancients to revere or fear. And this is where I get to introduce the second definition of God in this video, and that is in reference to that which is. This is to say that in this case, the nature of things, the way things are, life, death, and the rules that govern them are God. In the words of the Abrahamic God, I am that I am. And I know that the game is more heavily influenced by Buddhism and I'm now forcing it into an Abrahamic monotheistic lens, but fuck you, I like this lens, I think it makes for cool comparisons, and I think it's worth talking about. This is my video and I can do what I want. Also, am I the only one who thinks that Martin the Warrior's I Am That Is from Redwall is a reference to the great I Am? I haven't seen this talked about anywhere. This has nothing to do with Rain World, I just recently rewatched Redwall and want to talk about it. The term fear of God is a pretty loose term in terms of how it's actually used. It's often thought of as just incredible fealty or devotion. But it can also mean genuine and actual fear, to be afraid of God, of what is. And from that place of fear, instead of bowing to it, to rebel against it. That is the ancient fear of God, this constant yearning and desire to escape or supersede what is. The religion of the ancients represents this worship of death and unexistence through this fear of what actually is. And this is the sort of fear that Five Pebbles develops over time. The desire to complete his task by any means necessary in order to escape, going around the self-destruction taboo in order to do so. Willing to destroy his friends for a chance at that escape. And yes, he does eventually come around sacrificing himself in order to help her, but this video isn't about that. This video is about fear. And it's with this fear in mind that we can finally talk about the last playable slug cat in the game. Chapter two, again, this is my video and I can format it how I want. At this point in the game, an incredibly long time has passed. The iterators have collapsed and failed and seeing as their processes were the last remaining source of heat on the planet, the rain has stopped and everything has begun to freeze. You play as a little green slug cat known as the Saint. The Saint has an incredibly long and sticky tongue which acts basically as a grappling hook allowing him to swing incredibly long distances. The saint is also afraid of God, not the iterators, they can't do anything anymore, not the ancients, they're gone. He's afraid of God, of what is. He wants to find attunement and ascend past the cycle. Of all the slug cats, he's the only one who can communicate with the iterators without a mark of communication. And once he reaches the highest possible karma level, he gains the ability to fly and ascend things with his mind. However, he isn't able to ascend himself. He has to do that the old fashioned way, the same way as the slug cats who chose to and the same way as the ancients. The Void Sea. The Void Sea is exactly what it sounds like, a sea of void. It's found underneath the world and is used to completely destroy matter. This is where the ancients went to ascend. However, when some of them tried to ascend, they couldn't fully. Some say it's because they were so tied to existence by something, be it greed, ambition, pride, etc., that they couldn't be fully erased. They were trapped between existing and not as echoes of what they used to be. And this is exactly what happens to the saint when he tries to ascend he's left as an echo. Now, some people theorize that it's because of his excessive pride that he was unable to ascend, because he thought he was above it all, his ego got too large to be fully deleted. But personally, I think it's because he's an abomination. I think the saint is far from his namesake, and is an affront to God. The saint is not acting in accordance with nature, he's acting in defiance of it. The use of void fluid as a way to erase yourself isn't part of the cycle, it's a cheap workaround. The concept of ascendance is a sort of attack on the cosmic homeostasis that is the cyclical nature of life and death, and by attacking that, the saint has attacked God. And so he's punished for his blaspheming. This game is a cycle of that which is created, trying to exceed their creators while working within the bounds of the limitations that are put on them by their creators. It's constant tiers of different beings trying to play God to each other and eventually all finding out every way in which they are not. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands, 
stretch far away. This video for me was a sort of exercise in deeper thinking. I could have gone through and done a normal review of the different mechanics and map changes in the DLC, but I felt like the game deserved more than that. For all that the game innovates and the stories that it tries to tell, it deserves people who are willing to look at the game in new weird ways and try to say something new. Because a story about creation deserves creativity. Now subscribe and go watch this video where I talk about how Rain World is a masterclass in bullshit. Oh, we did it. We're done. Holy shit. I'm done. And it only took fucking three hours.